All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's wonderful program. CNN correspondent and veteran journalist Tom Foreman will discuss his uh, book, My Years of Running Dangerously, A Dad, a Daughter, and the Ridiculous Plan. And he'll be in conversation with author Dale Phillips, who facilitates the Tewksbury Library's writing group. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dale. Uh, so Dale T. Phillips uh, studied writing with Stephen King. Dale has published novels, over 70 short stories, collections, articles, jokes, and poetry. He's appeared on stage, television, and an independent feature film. He has also appeared on two nationally televised quiz shows, including Jeopardy! And Dale also co-wrote and acted in a short political satire film called The Nine. So uh, without, let's, without any further ado, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Dale for being our facilitator and moderator and booking agent and a whole lot more tonight. So Dale, take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert, and thank you to the library. And thank you, Tom, for uh, deigning to appear on our program. It is <laughs> wonderful that uh, our reach is extended that happens to get caught by a nationally prominent uh, journalist who then uh, agree to be on our show for no pay, I might add. <laughs> So our, our thanks to you and our thanks to CNN for allowing you the night off. It was very uh, nice. It was very nice. Thanks for inviting me. I Listen, uh, before anything else is said here, I have always been my entire life a big believer in libraries. I love libraries as a kid. Uh, we lived a lot of places, but when we lived in central Illinois, we lived about three, four miles outside of town. And I would go to the library on my bicycle and I would get books. And because they were long, straight farm roads, I would ride home, no hands, reading on my bike <laughs> while I got home because I loved everything I could get from libraries. Libraries are one of the most special places in the world to me. Wonderful. Yeah, Hank Phillippe Ryan tells about riding her horse to the library and then doing the same thing. You know, well, if you're on the horse, you don't need your hands as much. So, you know, the horse yeah. knows where it's going. Yeah. So, yes, we're, we're big fans here. And the library does share this uh, recording with some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, folks, normally I do a bio of the the guest but i think tom foreman needs very little introduction for those of you who know what cnn is i mean he's been a prominent journalist a professional journalist for over 20 years and then he goes and he's able to write a non-fiction book that just happens to knock your socks off without apparently book training except for the novel he tucked in the drawer like many many people do <laughs> yeah. but um what we like, uh, Tom. Thank you so much for for coming here. So we're gonna we're gonna focus, folks, on nothing political. We're focusing on Tom's writing, his book, and his very peculiar hobby of seeing just how much punishment the human body can stand. <laughs> his book is My Year of Running Dangerously: A Dad, a Daughter, and a Ridiculous Plan. This is available in hardcover and paperback and if you haven't read it yet you must pick this book up and you must read it it is so inspirational for so many reasons um now budding writers are here and we love origin stories mm -hmm. so could we start at the beginning how did you decide on journalism as a profession how did you learn the craft and how did you climb to the top mm. Uh, but remember, I started on journalism. It's it's interesting. I, I kind of need to update my bio for CNN because I'm actually closing in on about 50 years of journalism now because I started in high school. Um, I, I liked writing. I liked telling stories. I started in radio in high school. And so I right away started doing reporting to some degree and writing to some degree. And because I love books so much and I love the power of stories so much, uh, I just, I was interested in films. I thought the idea of making films would be a wonderful thing. But back then, that was kind of out of the reach for a lot of normal people out in most of America. And we had lived around different places, South Dakota, Illinois, Alabama. And I was finishing high school in Alabama. Um, and I was, I wanted to make films, but I had no idea how one would make a film except to go to Hollywood and starve. And that didn't even seem like that would work out because I was reading American <laughs> Film Magazine, which was suggesting that wasn't really a promising way to go about this. So uh, because I'd worked in radio, 
I decided as I sort of burned through college quickly in three years, I was, I thought, well, television is something that, I mean, television news is a way that you get to make little movies every day. And one of the things that I had learned from reading film magazines is that one of the problems with the young screenwriters is they hadn't experienced enough. They would write these plays, they would write these screenplays about life and they hadn't, didn't know anything about life. And I thought, well, journalism seems like a great way to learn about life, to learn about cameras, to learn about sound, and to learn about the kind of writing that, that is that kind of storytelling. So in a nutshell, that's what happened. I, I went to work in, uh, I got hired in a local station in Alabama. I spent several years there. Then I went to New Orleans, which we only lived there for five years. We still consider New Orleans home. <laughs> we have two daughters. We have two daughters who live in LA and they were both born in Colorado. We always told them when they were little, uh, remember you were born in Colorado, but you're from New Orleans. <laughs> and so, uh, so that, and New Orleans, of course, is a great, great, great city for stories. And, oh, Lord. and so anyway, I went to New Orleans for a few years. And then after New Orleans, uh, my wife was in huge demand in her field in uh, pharmacy and pharmacy association management. And she kept getting job offers. And ultimately, she had a job offer that made me talk to somebody who I knew at ABC News when it was the Peter Jennings years. And I just called him saying, do you know of any jobs in Chicago where she might go? And he said, well, if you're sending tapes, why don't you send us one? And in very short order, they had me fly to New York and I met Peter and they said, okay, come to work for us. And I spent 10 years there. Then I, was, I got, I really, I got tired of living on airplanes. <laughs> and uh, I went to National Geographic while they la launched their new channel, they, you know, to see what they did. And then, and then I left there and I came to CNN and I've been there ever since. So. Wonderful. Now, Here's a question. Because journalism has such stringent requirements, I mean, there's length, there's always the deadline, and there's the material, the source material. So does it take a particular mindset or type of person uh, to be a journalist? Or can you say, I want to be one and I will learn it? You can, yeah, you can learn it. I mean, it, it's, uh, there's no question you can learn it. But it's like most things. My, my father used to say, and I believe this is true of most things, in most endeavors in life, 10% of people are really good at it, 10% are really bad at it, and 80% kind of fluctuate somewhere in the middle. So can you learn it? Yes, you can learn it. Being good at it is a different matter. And I believe this is true of writing as well. I, I, honestly, I believe it's true of, of virtually everything, but certainly all the arts. Most people, in my experience, they will pursue something to a certain level of competence maybe even what might be called excellence. And when they hit that plateau, because this is all easy because you're learning everything for the first time, mm. super easy. That's why, that's why so many of us have drawer novels because the first time it's very exciting and you are learning a lot, but you're nowhere near good at it. And then when you hit this plateau where you're reasonably good, most people stop because this is slow. This is very steep because you know nothing. But now you know what almost everybody knows. And because you hit where what almost everybody knows, you stop. Most people don't try. This, to me, is the most important part. This is the part where you're bored. This is the part where you think, well, I'm as good as anybody else. Why isn't it working? <laughs> and that's where I think you have to work because now this is where you're going to pick up the extra 1% or 2% that raise your game higher. And I think with young journalists, particularly as, as challenging as journalism is in the field, I think you have to be willing to love what you do because most people don't make much money at it. You have to take often terrible hours. In the world we live in today, you might have to take terrible abuse, but you have to care that much about telling the truth. And you have to care that much about this idea that the stories of our society, the stories of our life, matter. They matter to posterity. They matter to the moment. They matter, they matter to our ability to be a society. So that's what it is. I love the little movies that are TV news. And it is a very different type of writing. But, but most types of writing are different from each other. There, <laughs> there are some people who are really good across all genres. But, you know, not, not that many. Well, what you described uh, 
can apply to to fiction writing to writing books sure. and i tell people the trouble is is each book i do i do absolutely the best i can do and then the next book you write you're trying to up your game sure. and you're like but i did as good as i could do what do i have to do how do i up my game you know you've got to break some rules you've got to experiment you've got to try new things you've got to be willing to fail i think but it's yeah, as you said do. the stories do matter and i feel the books do matter and the short stories do matter i also write a lot of different types of short stories because if you can affect the reader i tell people we're like wizards we're like doctor who we can travel through time and space Something I wrote today can be read by somebody not even born yet, and it can affect them. It can move them to laughter or tears or thinking about something. I go, that's a that's a kind of power that's amazing. You can oh, do the okay. same thing with if people can find your broadcast in the future and go, wow, there's something that meant. Yeah, and it's and it's sort of and even in the moment, it's just sort of a it's a different kind of writing. I will say that because they're. When I talk about people doing it who want to do it, especially for television, I can speak mostly to television. I've written some things for newspapers and things, but that's not my, that's not my, my main thing. Mainly television done properly. And I will be honest, you don't see it done really properly that much. <laughs> there's, there's just so much crush on a good daily basis that, that people feel the pressure of it. But done properly, even under tremendous time constraints, and and my wife and my kids both know that that i have a an internal clock that is as accurate as anything you can imagine i because i've lived a whole life dealing with the clock and knowing exactly how much room i have to tell the story when it has to be done when the parts are going to come in but done properly what you're doing is you're hitting this really wonderful alchemy between the words and the images and the sound that's what makes it like filmmaking. And told properly, you know, people will often say a newspaper, oh, well, they can describe, you know, they have thousands of words to tell a story or a magazine, thousands <laughs> of words to tell a story, to which I will say that is true. And I have the greatest respect for them for doing that. On the other hand, if I want to show you a neighborhood in Baltimore, and I start my piece with that picture of that street, and you see a dog running across the street and a car turning the corner and someone blowing a horn in the different distance because of the nature of human humans and how we take in information you will learn so much about that neighborhood in three seconds that would that might take me three paragraphs to explain to you in print and you still may not get it so it's sort of hitting that that you know meshing it all together and saying how do i use all of these tools to put people in the moment and make them understand what happens here and why it matters. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, Dickens could take pages to describe something and he would do it beautifully and thoroughly, mm -hmm. but in a images, you could pan down that street right. and get, get that and go, oh, no, and I get it, I see this world. You could read something from Dickens, I could read something from Dickens, any one of you out there listening could read something from Dickens, and we would all get an impression of what Camden Town looks like. But all of our impressions would actually be different. Mm -hmm. If we're just taking it for words. Dickens, by the way, did something that I think is incredibly important to all writing. I really believe this is important. Dickens read, all, well, as he wrote, he read everything out loud. It's partially because he loved theater and because many of his novels would then be done as a theater piece as well, like a public reading. So he usually had a public reading version of some of his most popular novels versus the novel itself. But he read it out loud. I believe broadcasters in particular, and it's strange because I have many colleagues who don't do this. I've always been reading out loud in newsrooms. I'm sitting there writing and saying, oh, the governor today said he was going to, oh, yeah, that doesn't sound like <laughs> The governor today, the, well, the governor today, well, the new governor, yeah, and, I, and I play and I play and I play with it, and I say it out loud because we are a spoken medium. And if people do not hear it clearly, it makes a difference. And I, I, when I'm talking to young writers in our business, I will say, you have to learn about the sounds of words and mm -hmm. the cadence of words, the rhythm of words. Are you using a spiky word or a soft word? And, and what does that do to the overall understanding of the sentence or the paragraph or the story? 
So I'm a real believer in those things. And and I really take great heart in knowing that Dickens read his material out loud because he wanted his reading to hear, to, you know, when you read it, for it to hear properly. I, I love Cormac McCarthy. I love mm. Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy is not a good read aloud book. <laughs> right? it's, it's, that's not wrong. He's hit a certain vibe there, but that's Cormac McCarthy. I'm not sure all of us can hit that vibe. So reading right. out loud is a good way of checking your writing and saying, is this good? I always tell writers that. I said, take your piece, read it out loud, or have someone else read it out loud while you listen. Yeah. You will find if anything that clunks lands lands with a thud, you'll get it. You'll hear it. Yeah. And when it sings, you'll know it. And yeah. it will help you to become a better writer to develop your ear for good writing. I mean, the novel, my my drawer novel, I don't mean to just jump around, but that's very funny. That's fine. Worked, that's what we do here. I worked with a very good editor on the drawer novel because I had a, an agent who wanted to represent it. Uh, ultimately, what happened, the drawer novel was about domestic terrorism. And I wrote this story. And this agent in New York, this agency liked it and said, oh, I like this, you know, let's, but I want to put you with a really top flight editor who will mm -hmm. work on this, whose name eludes me at the moment, but he had worked on really big, very successful novels. And I learned so much in that process. Um, one of which was I had this one description of this train being blown up in a tunnel. And it I will tell you to this day, it was beautiful. It was an unbelievably beautiful poetic description of this train being blown up in this tunnel. And oh my gosh, I was so happy. And this editor, sent it back with like three pages just <laughs> out. and all he wrote at the beginning was the train entered the tunnel from which it would never emerge okay he, but he said, he yeah. said, what people will imagine on their own is more powerful than what you can write sometimes true sometimes true sometimes true yeah it's hard now to what you what you say about uh the the thorough and the cinematic almost view of what it is your book reminded me of of laura hillebrand's sea biscuit the book and the movie because without because having of, because there's a lot of running involved well yeah <laughs> moving moving fast along a perilous track yes well you have two legs instead of four but no the uh the fact that even if you don't care about horse racing what she did was to make you care about mm -hmm the characters, about the race, about what's happening. And she also puts you in that race. I, well, yeah. reading her, I could feel the dirt clods coming up, the sweat coming down, the smell of the horse next to you and the, the sight of them going fast, the, the feel of your heart going, your senses did that. You put us in those races. Oh, you, you put us running down those rocky trails, uh, looking out for the rocks that are gonna break your ankle and <laughs> leave you dead. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Thank you. It's funny. I was just I was looking here at uh, somebody to ask, how did I decide to set this running goal and how did you get your daughter to join? Yeah, you? we'll we're going to get to all that. I know. Yeah, we read them oh, whenever uh, you want to, whenever you we, want we to. find a natural break point and do that. So, okay. Okay. yeah, I was like, please elaborate for those who haven't read your uh, your book. Well, uh, please do uh, how you accepted the challenge and then went beyond. Well, it just, uh, in a nutshell, and it's fun, I, I like, what you, it's very nice what you just said about my book. I really appreciate it. Honestly, the most lovely thing about this process, by a long shot, has been the fact that I still get notes every, you know, every few weeks from people just all over the place. And somebody will find me on social media and they'll say, hey, I read your book. I ran with my daughter or my son. And we had such a great time. And I go to many races. I, I was running the Big Sur Marathon last year. And at the beginning of it, all of a sudden, this woman from the Netherlands or somewhere, I can't remember where she's from. All of a sudden, she sees my daughter and I, Ronnie and I, who are big in the book. And she suddenly goes, oh, my gosh. And she comes running over and starts talking about how the book was this inspiration to her. And her <laughs> husband was running his first marathon. And it was great. That's the great pleasure is to know that there was some kind of, that it touched somebody and that the story mattered to people. Um, the way this happened really was I was, uh, in a nutshell, in the book, I was a natural runner as a young person. I was naturally, uh, I'm not a wildly athletic person in that my I wasn't great at baseball. I played all the sports. I just wasn't great at them. I'm 
played football, but I wasn't great at it. But running was something that I just had a natural uh, talent for. I, I, I honestly think it, for those of you who are runners, I think that like some people are born tall and it helps them at basketball. I think yeah. I was born with, for some reason, a very high uh, uh, ability to develop my VO2 max. I think the way I, think the way I proxi- process oxygen is really good. And a tolerance for pain. Well, tolerance for pain, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but, it, but uh, I think that really made it. So I was a natural runner, but I didn't train much. Hmm. But when my oldest daughter uh, started school at Georgia Tech, uh, she was studying aerospace engineering. My younger daughter also went to Georgia Tech and studied computational media. The oldest one <laughs> was studying aerospace engineering. And she said to me, I want to run my first marathon. Will you help me train? Well, I really thought my marathoning days were behind me because I know how much work it is. Because I I had done four marathons in my 20s, none of them particularly good. Um, And I never really trained properly. And I said, sure, I'll help you. And then, because for the first time in my life, I actually trained to run. I I suddenly realized how easy and fun it could be and that I could do better than I thought. And so the whole adventure grew from there. Having, getting her through her first marathon was this great wonderful thing i was very happy for her and then when it was done i thought well i put all this effort in what else can i do and that's where it grew into the what was it four four half marathons three full marathons my first 55 mile ultra marathon all in one year from almost a standing start which i wouldn't recommend to most people trying to do it but (laughs) but, uh, it worked so now you said you never trained when you were young. You would run and you were okay at it, you know, good at it, without having to train. Where did you develop the discipline to do more? Was it the the mental discipline of journalism that got you into that? That said, Or did you just say a, a switch was thrown, you said, now I must have this discipline to push through the pain, the training hours, the work schedule? I knew I would have to do that to run marathons in my 50s i just knew i would have to that was all there was to it but the other part of it is the the discipline i have long believed that um if you have the ability to turn on and off obsession you can be really good at things a lot of people have trouble turning it on and off And it reminds me of uh, uh, all the books I've read about flow, about people getting into flow. Mm. I guess that's really what this is. But I always had that from the time I was little. I I was I was very big on. I could focus for long periods of time on things that I was interested in, and Mm. that was true of journalism. You have to do some crazy hours and some long pushes, and you have to be able to have a clear head in the middle of chaos. You have to be able to you have to be able to stand on the edge of a hurricane and still write sentences that make sense. So so I, I think that helped me going in, but mainly it was also just a realization. I had been through marathons. I knew what they were like. Mm-hmm. I thought I cannot fake my way through now. I'm gonna have to do the right thing. No and, slacking off allowed. No, no. And and especially when I started looking at the ultra marathons, that was mm-hmm. a different uh that was a different animal altogether. Yes, yeah, not. I think writing a book takes uh, a discipline, and I, I like what you said about being able to turn obsession on and off, because it is obsessive behavior to write a book and continue through day after day, week after week, you know, as the years pile up, and then do it again and again and again, but it's good to have a life in between. So being able to turn off that obsession and spend time with the family, spend time on doing other things. Oh, yeah as well and i don't know how you were able to do anything else with your work schedule and the running schedule yeah well i told i I tell running groups because i speak to a lot of running groups and i speak to a lot of people who want to start marathoning for the first time and one of the things i say to them is if you were going to marathon you need to be honest with yourself about how much time this is going to take marathons are they're time consuming the training schedule is you have to be honest with yourself about the time it's going to take, you're going to have to be honest with your family or your friends about the time it's going to take. Because you will reach a point at which you have to say to people, 
I, I'm sorry, I can't be there for this movie. I can't do this thing. I'm not going to be available for the next year. <laughs> well, it's usually a marathon training cycle tends to be about 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. And the last six of it is where it really stacks up. But six weeks is a long time, right? And I always say to these marathoners, I say, first of all, look at your life. Decide if you really have the bandwidth to handle this. Mm -hmm. The minute you finish your marathon, you need to apply yourself just as vigorously to repairing the damage that was done to your relationships by all this time you spent. <laughs> I think that's also kind of true. There's a point in writing a long project like a book where you start getting toward the finish line and you need to make... So by the way, this is actually where I write when I'm writing on books in this room. I might have a record player back there and I play <laughs> records <laughs> because they make me get up every 15 minutes. And like, That's good. That's good because you got to get up and move uh, around. Uh, I, I think that uh, what happened when I was writing this book I, I got to the point where I I did not I didn't start this project to be a book, by the way. I just started because I wanted to run and run more. And it just the more I it went on, the more I thought, boy, this is really quite a story. And this is worth telling. And so then I started putting it together. But what I would do was take uh ultimately I, I do not I'm not one of the uh what are the two terms you use people people use for are you like an organizer or a gardener or what is it like do you uh, we call it a pantser and a plotter. For yeah, writing, exactly, right. uh, I mean, making I mean, an outline and, and structuring and organizing everything in advance so you'll know where it's going versus writing into the dark of, I'm not sure where this is going to go. Yeah, I'm a little bit more of the second. I mean, I, I have an idea about it. One thing that I will say is I do in broadcast writing, I suggest to young writers, one of the great benefits when the computer came along and I was no longer writing on typewriters was... I always say to people, write the part you know. Even if you're doing a two-minute news story, a minute and a half news story, and you don't know how you want to start and you don't know how you want to end, starting and ending, very important. Mm -hmm. But you do know how you want to do the middle or one paragraph, well, write that part. And then build from that, right? And the same with the book. I knew some things that I wanted to say. So I started writing the things I knew I wanted to say. And once I built enough of that, that I reached the point where I knew kind of what I was doing, then what I would do is I would, I actually, I think I used sheet, full sheets of paper at the time. I would write on each sheet of paper what that chapter was about. Mm -hmm. And I spread them out on the floor in this room so I could stand back and look at it. And when I looked at it that way, I felt like I could see the holes. I could look and say, oh, well, clearly this jump from here to here is coming too fast or too slow. Or I need some kind of a pacer in here to let up on the craziness of this for a minute and let people think. And over here, I need to explain a little bit more, that sort of thing. And, and that helped me get through the process. Very, very helpful to make sense of it. And when I got to the end of writing this book, I don't remember why, but for some reason, my wife and both daughters were gone for a week. And that was really helpful at that moment because I needed, <laughs> that's, that's when I needed to come home from doing TV all day and say, okay, eat something over the sink, come up here, and spend the next five, six, seven hours till two, three, four in the morning, whatever it was, and say, okay, this part's under control. Oh, and great, great rule of thumb that I learned back in that process. I don't remember who, who I read advice from all sorts of people, including your old pal, Stephen King, who has, of course, wonderful ideas about how to write. Seriously, <laughs> wonderful ideas. One of the greatest ideas, for those of you who like to write, and I also think it's kind of about running, too. Uh don't stop when you don't know what to do. Stop when you absolutely know what to do. Because then when you come back the next day, you're ready to go. If you stop and you don't know what to do, you'll come back the next day and sit down and you still don't know what to do. And you That's a Hemingway uh, idea. It's Was like, it? yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you, you want to keep the engine running. So you stop in the middle, sometimes even the middle of a sentence. Because yeah. when you come in, you don't have to ramp up. You jump right in. Yeah, uh, you finish right. that, and now I the agree. wheels are greased, and you keep going. Yeah, it's a great. It's a great idea, and it's extremely helpful, and uh, and that really helped as I sort of went steaming into the the home, the the last part of it there, and I felt great about that, and it felt really good. That said, I've been asked for years now about the follow up book, and what I said from the beginning is I, 
I don't really have anything that I think should be that needs to be said about Ronnie. You so said what you needed to say. I mean, well, that was now pretty I complete. That. It was no, I, I went on this know. journey yeah. and here's the here's the record of this journey and here's the ending and here's the lessons learned. Yeah, and now and now I think finally after this much time, I think I do have some more to say about running and I've been working on a second book, but it's been it, it's been slow and I'm and I keep asking myself, is this something that needs to be said, or are you just filling space? Because that's <laughs> right, you're just doing it for as an exercise, right? Practicing typing. But I did write a I did write my first novel. Well, not my first novel, my second novel. My first novel, as I like to say, my every time I don't every time something doesn't get published, I refer to it as practicing typing. So it's I all practice on the first one. Uh the second novel that I wrote during the pandemic, I really, really like. I haven't been able to find a home for it yet. And I and believe me. I don't know about all of you out there who try to write or something. This is the part I am the absolute worst at. So much so that I've threatened many times to say, I will just start giving my books away online to anybody who wants them because I care about the writing. I care about the readers. Mm -hmm. I, I hate like poison the process of books being published. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just don't like it. I, I don't like the business of it. I don't like dealing with it. And, and I had a great, great, great publisher with Penguin. They were great. They were wonderful to work with. I just, I just don't like, it was, in fact, it went so well the first time, so well the first time, <laughs> that I had no idea that it could be as difficult as people think it are. But when I started this You novel, got spoiled. Yeah, very much so. And this is a good novel. It, it also involves a lot of running, but it's, uh, it's a good novel. It's fun. Well, if you watch something like Run Lola Run, I mean the whole movie is about running yeah. and Yeah. Well this this in a nutshell, because we're just talking, um, this is just like the first book, when you talked about the when you talked about Seabiscuit and sort of the relatability part of it. I when people ask me in just conversation, like what's your book about, I will say my book is about family and it's about commitment and it's about meeting hardship and it's about getting older. And it's about relationships and it happens to have a lot of running in it but it's not a book about running although mm -hmm. for many people it is a book about running i get that this novel i've written is about four young people stranded in the nullarbor plain of australia through just mm -hmm. a series the way people get stranded people ignore warnings and they make little tiny mistakes and suddenly it becomes bad hey you're from maine Maine is one of those places where people get stranded. You can yeah. die if you don't take the proper precautions and don't have the equipment and the knowledge of what to do and how to survive when things go wrong, which exactly. they often do. Right on the nose there, because what this what this book I've written, the novel I've written is about, really, is when you are suddenly in a circumstance where your very existence depends on what you believe in, what do you believe in? Mm -hmm. Do you believe in science? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the power of the team? Do you believe in individual effort? Do you believe in luck? What is it that you believe in? Or is it a combination of all of those things? And so that book really is about that. Like, how do you make these decisions? It's, yes, it's an adventure. You can just read it as a thriller if you want. <laughs> but you can also read it as something that goes beyond it. And my wife keeps telling me that the, the title is bad. Probably it is. Well, a publisher will change that anyway, so don't worry. Maybe. I don't know. But I don't <laughs> think it's, uh, but it's hard to let. That's the one thing I have trouble letting go of because I really like it. I, I'm like, oh, no, that's a good title. Well, that's why I'm independent because some titles I can't and will not change. And I can do <laughs> and I have all the control over everything. You know, the price, you yeah. know, how it's published, uh, the content, the the cover the marketing, everything. Well, and you and, you and I may talk more about that because when it comes to novels, I may go that way because I can, I've got, I've got other uh, nonfiction projects that I've been writing on and fiddling with that are, are really, that I really like. I just have to quit messing around and get them done. But if you just want to get your, your fiction out, I am the guy to talk to. Yes, I can help with that. We'll talk about that. Whatever. So speaking of running, uh, my friend Dave is a, is quite the runner and I'm he gets up at five in the morning and he runs, you know, 12 miles or something. And I'm like, why? So he he gets you. He understands. So I made him read your book and he loved it. He said it was so much fun. 
and the humor was great and he drew similarities to your running adventures and the impressions um and he's done a number of marathons he ran uh an ultra he ran 45 miles to your 55 Excellent. and he didn't start until his late 40s so he's now now just turned 60 and his question is do you favor a uh, trail or road running and are you still having such adventures? I would say probably less so that running into the dark and thinking about dying in the desert where you <laughs> almost did. <laughs> I've grown it's a like being smarter. lost in Nullivore. Yeah. yeah, I've grown a little bit smarter about it, I guess, or a little more cautious maybe. Um, I still, trail running is just the most lovely thing in the world. I love trail running. Uh, what the second running book will be about, if I get it, though, however, will be about qualifying for Boston and how that happened. And and my and the notion, the kind of nutty notion I had in my late 50s of saying, maybe I could actually be fast because I never thought of myself as fast. I thought of myself as having enormous endurance. And so I started training to get fast. So that meant a lot of road work. Uh, Dave, you'll understand a lot of road work which is different than trail work. Um, there are people who are really good at blending the two and can be really good, like Mike Wardian down here, beast mode, this dude. But uh, there are people who are really good at that. I am not one of those mere gods. I am just a guy who runs. Uh, love the trails, though, still. I love the trail. I've taken some of the most terrible falls on the trails. I uh, whack my knees open, the blood's running down my legs, and I'm like... Oh, the way you described it, it was like an obstacle course. I mean, it good kind of grief. Can be. It kind of can be, but it's also, oh my gosh, it's so unbelievably beautiful to be out there in the snow. And I, I, I running with a headlight is a better thing, but there was something that was so magical about running through the woods as the light failed and the, the moon came up. In fact, the last... 50 miler I did a couple of years ago, which was also Stone Mill. Um, late in the day, I wasn't running great, but I was running okay. And uh, the sun went down again, and it wasn't a very cold race. That race is usually very cold. It wasn't terribly cold, but the sun went down again. And because ultra marathons are very small fields very often, they're usually a couple hundred people or whatever, you, over 50 miles, you spread out, and you end up running <laughs> long periods of time alone. <clears throat> and all of a sudden it was just dark and the moon came up and it was unbelievably beautiful shining through the trees and on this little stretch of the trail there in the woods all of a sudden a, a whole bunch of owls just <clears throat> lit up above me calling to each other and I thought every step of effort today was worth it to be here at this moment because this is completely magical. And I still had, you know, eight miles to go or something ridiculous, six miles or something. And my legs were killing me and I was tired, but I thought totally worth it for this amazing moment. Those are the trails, the trails do that. You don't get that on the road very often. Yeah, that's what it's all about. For me, it was cross country skiing about being in the woods. It's the same thing. You're by yourself. There's no sound, the wildlife. And if you go at night, the moon shining, you know, on the snow, and it's it's so peaceful and serene. It's another world that it takes you into. It is, it is. and it's uh, I, I I carry a headlamp now when I do that, but it was kind of nice when I didn't carry a headlamp. And as the dark came, it just it just felt magical. It felt like I know I could probably fall and kill myself here, but also isn't this beautiful? Isn't this great? <laughs> yeah, if you never take some kind of risk, you won't uh, you won't the get point? that that moment of bliss, <laughs> that absolute. Uh, expansion of your world into something so totally, you know, some people, it's like microdosing, you know, they're, they're like, you know, my consciousness expanded. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah. I think you can do that in the right setting with nature yeah. in the, in the proper place and the proper mindset. Yeah. You don't need that other stuff. You can achieve it naturally. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. That's kind of like uh, Burroughs said about at the end, he said, man, I wish I'd known I could get every effect that I got with drugs. I could, could have done it naturally. I didn't need that. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. So Dean, Dean loved your appearance on the Neuromatch conference back in 2021. And uh, T. Stock says, can you explain where the title came from? My year of running dangerously? Yes. Oh, the title came, honestly, the title came from, uh, you know, that old uh, 
Mel Gibson, Sigourney Weaver. My, the, yeah, the year of living dangerously. The, the year of living dangerously. I always loved. I like that movie a lot. Really, I mean, it's it was, a great movie. But I also liked. I always loved that title. I just, oh, what a great title! And as I was working on a title for this, I don't know why that popped into my head, and I thought, oh, I like this. This because that's what it felt like. I mean, as I expanded throughout the year to each next event and expanded the amount of running I was doing and the way I was going to do it, it felt like, I, I mean, I thought to myself, how is this happening? I mean, how am I not getting injured? And how am I not blowing up in all of this? But it just kept getting better. And honestly, when I went to the, the you know, the 50 mile or the 55 mile race, I, that, that was just surreal to me because it's hard for, you know, if you're younger and the older I get, the more everyone is younger, um, the, uh, it's hard to remember that back in the 1970s, the early 1970s, running a marathon was still considered the, the domain of the gods. Like mm -hmm. normal people didn't do this. So even to run back then was like kind of a big deal. Um, people forget, I don't remember the exact numbers I mentioned it in the book. The first New York city marathon was around the early seventies or late six, early seventies, I think. And only had like 175 runners and only a portion of them finished. So, well, I think Jim Fix popularized running a lot. He did. Back then. Was, he he made it good. like acceptable that yeah. people didn't look on it like you're some kind of weirdo if you want to do this thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He made Jim Fix made a huge contribution to the, to what running could be. But but it was interesting. The, the idea of running more than 50 miles, I just didn't it had never really occurred to me until I heard about it. And then to do it was super fun. So that's where the title came from. And the, and my publisher, David Rosenthal, good guy said to me at one point, he said, I think we might need a little more title to make sure people know what it is. <laughs> like a subtitle. So people know right. what it is. And I just literally blurted out at that moment. I said, how about a dad, a daughter and a ridiculous plan? So I kind of like the alliteration <laughs> of it. And he said, perfect. And that was it. So that made me happy. In fact, this when we did the cover of the book, it was interesting because we were doing the cover and they had these two kind of grungy looking shoes. And I said, I think they were both like blue. And I said, maybe you should make one of them pink and one of them blue to help reflect the dad daughter thing. Mm -hmm. Kind of ham handed, but in a way I thought it would be helpful. And then when they came out with the paperback, they liked this uh, picture of me running through the snow. <laughs> which is kind of fun and you know this this picture i took with an iphone that i jammed into uh the branch of a tree it was wow so, it's so cold and snowy out there that day i thought well, this is kind of interesting let me get a picture of this and i took the picture and they saw that and they said oh that should be the cover I'm, all right fine excellent now at what point did you conceive of your journey as a book uh while the journey was going on or afterwards you said there i have done that hey i want to write about that or you took notes i guess during the process well no i didn't really take notes well, I mean, you had I, your I, log your running log yeah i have a running log of sorts that i was keeping and i have so i knew what my workouts were i have i've been lucky to have a very good memory i, I don't have exactly a i wouldn't say i have a photographic memory but i have a very good memory that remembers a lot of detail very precisely. Um, I learned that in part because early on in TV reporting, uh, Dan Rather had actually written in one of his books that he didn't do a lot of note taking because he found it off putting to people you were interviewing. That they, they it makes them clench up because they're like, oh, something's being written down. Whereas mm -hmm. if you just listen to them and talk to them, and you write down the few little things like I, I don't remember numbers usually really well so i'll write down numbers um but uh when did it become a book i would say mm, two-thirds of the way through i seemed to, i found myself thinking this is but well, I, I didn't think of a book then i just thought this is quite a story mm -hmm. and it's interesting and then when i hit the the long race then i thought oh this is this is a this is a really interesting story and it's inspiring and it's interesting and be fun to do. By the way, in the promotion of the book, I did something else, which I which I still think of as, as a lot of fun. I ran the Chicago Marathon. Two weeks later, I ran five marathons in five days, <laughs> one of which was the Marine Corps Marathon. This was all to help promote the book. Two days after that, 
I ran the New York City Marathon. And two weeks after that, I ran the Stone Mill 50 miler again. So that was the most that was that is the most running I've ever done in a in a uh, you know compressed well what did I just describe there five weeks something like that uh, that was a lot of running in a very short period of time and uh, as I as I was writing in the second book which if, if I ever get done you'll get to read um, I, I said that's enough among ultra runners that's enough for them to say well that's cute. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, that's nice. Uh, good for you. Perhaps you can run further, further, you know. So. Yeah. When you're done with the training wheels, then we'll talk. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, when I read about comedian Eddie Izzard running 30 marathons in 30 days, I just went, how is that even humanly possible? I, I, I can't even think that that's doable. It's this, that kind of running, you know, long distance running like that. And, and, and Eddie is a pretty good runner. Uh, he he knocks it down a little bit. Um, he doesn't have the runner's body. He doesn't look like a runner. I mean, he's got a very solid upper torso. Yeah, you know, he's not lean. He's not uh, elongated. He's yeah. You know, one of my friends uh, through all of this is uh, the Boston Marathon champion, Olympian, New York City Marathon champion, great great runner named Meb Kaflesky. And Meb and I have talked about uh, running a lot. We have a great time visiting all the time. And I uh, told Meb one day uh, when he was running in Brazil at the Olympics down in Brazil, they showed the front pack of runners. You talk about who looks like a runner. My my notion is anybody who's running looks like a runner to me. I'm proud mm. of running. And, but you you said in your book though that some of the people you're on these long runs with, you look at them, you go, well, they're not going to make it, and then oh, yeah. seven miles later, they're they're passing you. <laughs> yeah, they grind you into the ground. And then sometimes you see people, and I just ran the Erie Marathon last fall, and at the Erie Marathon, I, I qualified for Boston again, which made me really happy. But it was really funny because there were these young people. They, boy, you want to see some young people. I don't, I don't mean to, I want to make them, I want to encourage every runner, but I know some of them look like runners. They are fit, they are with it, and they just don't really know how to run a marathon yet. Hmm. And when I come steaming past them in the last six miles of the race, the look, you can just see the sense of how, <laughs> how is Father Time passing me? <laughs> hey, youngster. <laughs> Maybe in 40 years, you'll get it. <laughs> yeah. In, in any event, once, it was, once I did the 50 miler, I thought, this is a pretty good story. I should start writing this. And I just, and I just did. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I, one of the other rules I have for my own writing is if you're working too hard at a chapter, there's probably something wrong with it. There's probably something wrong. And, I, and, and that's, I'm not talking about the honest work because it takes a lot of work. If it's hard to describe or hard to get the flow right or something, like that, that's fine. That's work. If you're working too hard to make it feel interesting and you're bored out of your mind, well, I think probably the reader is going to be bored. If it's not fun for you, it will not be fun for the reader. Yeah, I think that's true. That and that's and that's within within the scope of 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 knowing that it's hard work anyway. Well, you know, from Maine we have our our Joni Benoit, so uh, yeah. near and dear yeah. to us. And in our region we have the Boston Marathon, which we think of as the gold standard. So is, the Boston Marathon is the most special marathon. In How did you qualify for that? What was your method to qualify? For well, the first time in my life, I worked on speed. Which, which I'd never, I, I always just thought running. Yeah, you said you never really cared about it. You, as well, finishing the race was more important than the time of the race. Well, I didn't, I mean, I guess I cared about the time, but I had no concept you could really do anything about that. I sort of thought, <laughs> you, <distance>. you. <laughs> you just run and you finish. And you just run, you, you just do it. <laughs> so I started doing all this, all this work, speed work and hill work and all sorts of things. Intervals, oh God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and lo and behold, they really work. It was really quite a, but it, but that was all kind of like my year of running dangerously. That was this year of learning so much about this and, and learning so much about running and really studying it instead of just doing it. And uh, it was like magic, like a magic trick to see how fast you, how much you could improve. Mm. Well, it's running a book, like you said, it, um, your first book is your, your MFA. I mean, that's how you learn to write a book, by doing it. Yep. I mean, you can get all the theory you want, but until you do it, you just don't get it. That's right. And that's don't right. understand how hard it is to 
create something and then you've got something which may not even be good and you're like well i spent a lot of time but it's like learning to practice an instrument you know you're not going to be good when you start out usually but if you apply yourself and you do focused uh increments of learning and getting better hey voila after a while look at that i made something i like to say about most things in my life it's been a long hard climb to the middle <laughs> there's there is so much more ahead to be better at i will say you know something great that was told to me many years ago i got to spend one of my favorite interviews of my entire life was the day i spent with the great animator chuck jones mm. he invented bugs bunny and animated the grinch and all of this and I really just loved being being with him. It was such an interesting day. And we talked most of the day about writing and literature, not cartoons. And uh, he was such an interesting man. And he had so many great things to say. One of the things he said is that when he went to art school, when he was 17, the teacher walked in the first day, the professor, and said, each one of you has 10,000 bad drawings. In. Mm. The sooner we get them out, the better. <laughs> let's start drawing and i remind myself of that i tell runners you should welcome the bad runs mm -hmm. because you have to have them. everything can't be perfect every time you have a bad run be grateful for it because that one's out of the way and you can work more toward the good run the same with writing welcome the bad days welcome the bad novel welcome the bad whatever because it can't all be perfect. And I, I really believe very much in this mathematical principle called graduation toward the mean, which, and I'm, I'm not a big mathematician, but my my two daughters, boy, they know it. My wife, too. Now, you said you weren't a numbers guy, so yeah. They, they are. <laughs> they know it. In fact, my, my older daughter now works for SpaceX, and the younger one covers Hollywood, interestingly enough. But uh, graduation toward the mean basically says there you know there's sort of an uh, an average basically to use colloquial language and when you have a really really great day writing or playing golf or whatever statistically tomorrow's probably not going to be as good because mm -hmm. you'll tend to move you'll graduate toward the mean toward average but when you have a really bad day probably tomorrow's going to be better so the funny thing is, when you have a bad day riding, a bad day golfing, a bad day running, whatever it is, you should be eager to go tomorrow. Mm -hmm. because it's probably going to be better. And most of us psychologically the other way. We have a great day and we're like, I can't wait to get out there again. And it's like, well, you're probably going to be disappointed, but go. I think people trick themselves. They, When you have a good day, oh, I'm improving. Now I will be at this level from yeah. now on. Yeah. And if you have a bad day, oh, I suck. I'll never get better, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, like golf, okay, in, in a book, I'm trying to do better the whole way through. In golf, if I go, I set a goal, I'm going to have 10 perfect shots today. That's my moment of zen. If I can hit those 10, it goes exactly where I want it. I get the good feeling. I did it just right. That's my goal. And the rest of it, it doesn't really matter. You know, uh, the other thing that Chuck Jones told me that I really, really liked, because this was just a great phrase, and I've used it much in my life. He said, um, artist is a gift word. Other people can call you an artist, but you can't call yourself one. Mm. And I thought, wow, what a great way of looking at it. And I, I, try to, I try to see a lot of this stuff that way, because on any given day, you know, you write a great sentence, you have a great run, you do a great job at your, you know, at your job or with your family or whatever you do. You, you cook a perfect loaf of bread, you do whatever. Sometimes that happens, and every time, I mean, I know it sounds sentimental, but I really try to say to myself, be grateful, because this thing came from something. I can't explain everything about it. For some people, it's about faith. For some people, it's about happenstance, nature. I don't know what it is, but I'm grateful for it, because I have so much ability to be bad at things. And I try not to be, but I play guitar, I play piano, I paint, I do all sorts of things. But but I recognize all the time when it goes well, I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity to be good. And that's one of the reasons I try to be so encouraging to everyone else. I really have on social media, several years ago, I just decided I, I, I just almost will never post anything negative about people. I mean, right, so, right. you know, news stories news stories that may be negative because they're it's the news it's a fact 
But I just don't, I just don't see any point in that. I think we all are so. <laughs> There's too much of that in the world. Yeah, we're also beaten up. And boy, is there anything easier in the world than slapping down somebody's attempt at creativity? Yeah, but, punching down. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's so it's such an easy thing to do and such a wrong thing to do. You know, I mean, people are struggling. Everyone's got their struggle out there, and and on any given day, someone might produce something beautiful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And on any given day, they may produce something terrible, because I do all the time. Well, I like what you say about that. You know, the the daemon or the the genius. Where does it come from? But I think a lot of people are so afraid to fail that they don't do things. And I think one of one of my great advantages is I was never afraid to look stupid or be bad at something. <laughs> and so I did so many things because like, oh, yeah, sure, I'm bad at this. But you know what? I've learned a lot. And the next time I do it, like you say, you're going to get a little better, hopefully, if you've learned. The smartest people I have met in, like I said, almost 50 years of covering the news, the smartest people I've met almost all readily say they don't know things they readily say they're wrong about things and most of them apologize very easily if i mean if they even suspect that they're wrong they're very quick to say well i'm sorry about that and i, yep. and I, I need to learn more and i always said the reason they're smart is because they're so quick to say i don't know everything tell me and i i've tried to do a lot of that in my life i don't know uh you know i i, I don't know I, I feel like I've learned things, but like you mentioned earlier, um, and, and for all of you who are listening out there, I just say this because it's true. The reason this is happening is because I saw Dale do an interview that I thought was just really, really well done. And I thought he's an excellent interviewer. And I was so impressed and I just sent him a note to tell him how much I liked it and this is why we're doing this. Um, but I admire your skills. I think they're great. And I think that the ability to look around you and want to learn from things no matter what you're doing is, is so is so helpful and the only way you can do that is by constantly recognizing that you don't know everything mm -hmm. and that you and that you can be wrong and and then and then being and that is part of what you described dale being fearless you know well, that's why i love hanging around writers because we never think we've perfected it <laughs> none of us ever have but we're willing to learn to get better, but they've always got better stories too. <laughs> no, they're not boring. Speaking about being fearless, I'm fearless about languages and I don't speak them very well. But I try. I, yeah, yeah, I, I, and, and completely fearless. Uh, great case in point, I was in uh, Russia years ago in Moscow for most of a summer and uh, I, I had two days notice I was going. <laughs> and I grabbed my bags and told my wife, I'm going to Russia for the summer. And away I went. <laughs> Go to Russia. <laughs> and, uh, and I was roaming all over and I was using a phrase book and trying to figure out how to speak Russian. And I'm pretty good at imitating sounds. Now I say that there's probably somebody in the audience who uh, speaks Russian who will say, oh, this is terrible. But I uh, was roaming around and I learned certain phrases, which I thought were really fun. Like one was, uh, I'll probably get this wrong. That was like, which means... I don't need the fat of life, but I do need to eat, which I thought was really funny. And another one was Zayarka na Prezvotia Aktivnia Oda, which means uh, government sponsored exercise in the morning leads to healthy relaxation. <laughs> anyway, but, but useful phrases, thing, useful but because phrases. I'm, but because I'm fearless, I will try. And there was a woman who stopped me outside the Pushkin Museum, and she was an older woman, and she said something to me in Russian, like, Good afternoon. I said, Good afternoon. And uh, some of the Russians told me, they said, your accent is really good for somebody who doesn't speak really any Russian. You sound right. So people think you can speak the language. I'm pretty sure what this woman said to me was she said something to me that took a long time. And when she finished, I responded to her and she looked very puzzled and I walked away. <laughs> and then I started reconstructing what I could of the conversation. And it was something like she said something like, I'm sorry to interrupt you. But that building across the river, is that the place where you get the licenses for the apartment buildings? Because I need to get one, and I don't know if that's the one, and I don't want to walk all the way over there, if that's the wrong building. <laughs> to which I said, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if it is or is not, but I can tell you that building is made of chocolate. <laughs> 
that's people's yeah. people's fear of looking ridiculous in a foreign language. But I've found that anyone in a foreign country is extremely pleased when you, especially well, as an American, try to speak, have learned something about their language, their culture. They're like, "Well, thank you, thank," you. and you're like, "No, no, you speak four languages, and I I'm barely literate in one." So <laughs> you know, trust me, it's the least I can do. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend when she went to Japan. She had learned a few Japanese phrases from reading Shogun. And she went over and would try to say them. And the people would look at her puzzled. It was as if she was speaking Shakespearean English. <laughs> Pretty, my lord, whence thou comest down the street. <laughs> that's that's one of the best. I love that. that I would love great. to do that. <laughs> that's great. So uh, T asks, can you repeat that quote? She could not hear it. And I'm not sure which quote, T, that that was... Uh, in reference to, we have done from, uh, Chuck Jones, maybe possibly. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Please, it, it, it was that you know everybody has. You all have ten thousand bad drawings in you. The sooner we get them out, the better. That may be it. If it's not, just text back again, and I will remember. I think it is now. Uh, that's the interesting thing. One of the things that really made me feel so good is that I read some of the early stories that Ray Bradbury published and they were terrible. And I go, wait, wait, this is Ray Bradbury. He didn't come out of the womb as a genius and everything that uh, came from his fingertips turned to gold. Tom, you're frozen a little bit. Either, oh, okay, there you are. There you go. And no, he published stories that were absolutely terrible. And I go, that's so encouraging. Yeah. He was able, able to turn that around and become a genius at this. I'm. I have a. I have a collection of short stories by Truman Capote, and most of them are not good. And mm. I really like. I really like that. It's like you know, we forget that what we end up seeing is the great works of people, because that's what becomes popular. That's what well, lasts, right? Yeah, the good lasts, stuff lasts. But, but read some of the other stuff, and it's not. You know, read some pieces by by uh, by Mark Twain, and read some pieces by Hemingway, and read some. Oh things Lordy, by yeah. Fitzgerald, and you'll read some of it, and you'll say, oh, this isn't very good. But let me tell you, that doesn't diminish The Great Gatsby. That's some fine, mm -hmm. fine, fine writing. And and it makes me feel hopeful, because it reminds me uh, that that this is a this is a an unending struggle to arrange and rearrange 26 letters and try to make something magical happen. And when you mm -hmm. do, it, it is magical. And it, and like you said, I don't know where it comes from sometimes. I feel, you know, oh, by the way, in terms of the discipline you talked about earlier, one of the things that I do for running all the time, I don't see one around here right now, but I take, uh, I do print out a schedule of what I need to run in that 16 weeks leading up to a marathon. Mm -hmm. I take a highlighter or a marker or something and I mark off every day. Running is a little tricky because you can get injured and maybe you can't do every day. That's different. But uh, Jerry Seinfeld said about writing comedy that he would take a calendar, physical calendar, and put big red X's on for every day that he wrote. Mm -hmm. Because that 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 dopamine or whatever it is you get from looking up and seeing, oh, look at all the red X's. Look how I didn't break the chain. I kept going. I find that kind of thing really useful for me. Probably some people don't because I think we have different brain types. But for me, I recommend that. I recommend that to writers because... It's so easy to not write. It's so yeah. easy to slack. It's so easy to like, eh, not today. Yeah. But if you do that, you look at that mountain that you built and you're like, ah, well, okay, I'll, I'll just get it done today. If I think that's what like running is like. If I can just force myself through it today, you know, tomorrow doesn't matter. Today, I'm going to do it. That's and you why, get that X on. That's why I sort of, you know, I hit that idea in the book very often. That if it's inevitable, it's ideal. The notion of saying, you know, here's what's inevitable. This is the moment that we have. I'm having a great time here. You know why I'm having a great time here? Because this is where I am. And I am not going to waste these moments of my life um, just not, not trying to be in the moments. I don't always succeed at that, but I try really hard to say this is the moment I have. And writing, uh, one of my running friends says he always reminds himself no, no, no. I get to run today. I don't have to run today. Right. 
I and get to write today. Me. Yes. And I get to write. I mean, but good gracious, what greater. This is the thing that I dreamed of as a child, to have a room in a house that I own, good heavens. Right. You know, the thing, and to be able to sit here and write and and to have I, I, you know to have a book that sits on a shelf and that somebody can walk by and pick up to me i the moment that happened i felt like well now if nothing else happens in my life i contributed something to that thing i love so much which is libraries and books and shelves and the story of humanity it's a tiny tiny little offering but i'm glad it's there and so i try real hard to remind myself of that i don't always succeed but when I don't want to put the effort in, when I don't want to try, when I just want to kind of wallow and feel like I'm not doing anything, I try to remind myself the day will come when I can't. Mm. And that day is going to come too soon for all of us. And so, so today, while you can, write the words down, write a sentence down, write something. And by the way, on the subject of writing, uh, something I'd like to mention to people, I'm a big fan of poetry. I read a lot. <laughs> I read a lot anyway. I always read, but I and I but I like poetry because I always I always say that poetry to me is the espresso of language. Really good poets, and trust me, there's a lot of bad poetry. But really good poets can in five lines, ten lines, it's just like a sledgehammer of imagery and emotion, and it just it just breaks you in half. And my daughters, you know, laugh. I can't read poetry without crying because it just, it touches me so mm -hmm. much. And mm -hmm. it's so amazing to think that people can take that time to say, I'm going to figure out this little part. That reminds me a little bit about Hemingway, the idea that he would spend like a whole day on a paragraph. You know? mm -hmm. But with poets, you're doing it for the love of writing. With, with almost no exceptions, you're not going to get famous for it. You're sure as hell not going to get rich for you're it. You're not going to make any money, that's for sure. <laughs> that's with writing in general, but but particularly for poets, and I admire them so much, the people who take that time to say, I'm going to craft, you know, uh, 40 words here, and they will make your world live. And I, that's, I'm just amazed. And if you want, if you want inspiration for what writing can do, read a good piece of poetry. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, would stay up late at night with Seamus Haney, you know, arguing about one word, the placement of that one word in a poem. <laughs> like, yeah. yes. right. right? That's an obsession. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, They're crazy. They're like the ultra runners. They're crazy, but I like they, them. They are. They are. <laughs> but, but, you know, and the funny thing is, as you talk about the discipline, I am the laziest person in the world, the most undisciplined. And I take my books to a book show and I've got 33 books out in 12 years and people are like agog and they're like, you must write all the time. And I go, yeah, <laughs> no, but like you said, I think it's switching the obsession on and off. You know, the great, like, uh, the great sports uh, uh, reporter, Dick Schaap, he was around for many, many years. Dick Schaap was very famous and Dick Schaap had a boatload of books. I mean, he was always writing books about like this sports figure and Bo Jackson and all. He was writing all these sports books. And one day, Dick was in our office in uh, Denver at the time with ABC News. And we'd just done something for World News with Peter. And, and Dick was there. And I said to Dick, Dick was said uh, he was going back to his hotel room to write. And I said, Dick, how do you how do you make yourself after a day like this go back to the hotel and write? And in that great Dick Shap voice, he said, one word alimony <laughs> <laughs> lovely <laughs> yeah i always use the aj liebling line i can write better than anyone who can write faster and faster than anyone who can write better <laughs> yeah yeah you remember bob remember the great bob dylan line somebody asked him about inspiration and he said my greatest inspiration is a deadline from the record company <laughs> yeah so if you can create deadlines for yourself and you can make yourself follow right. them that's all sorts of stuff. I mean, that's that. There's so much to that, and and you're going to have to drive yourself because who else is going to drive you? you yeah, know? they said I wait for inspiration. Unfortunately, it comes every morning at eight when I sit down to my typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> every morning. <laughs> so, um, uh, Alan asks. Uh, there's an expression in a book called "Age is just a number." Mm -hmm. uh, one meaning being one can achieve anything at any age, whether old or young. Did that motivate you to run the marathons and uh, later in life? 
just like you ignored the fact that your body was really past the prime of what m most people would consider yeah now's a good time to start you were like rather later yeah i was rather later i i don't uh i don't ignore it i'm older now so i know i can't ignore it i you just because there are real things that happen you know that change changes you get older but i try to think about it and to to uh to realize the difference between real limitations and imagined limitations. There are real <laughs> limitations, but we spend a lot of our lives being constrained by uh, what you mentioned earlier, the notion of feeling, oh, you know, people might not like this. Maybe people may think it's strange. People may, you know, ridicule me. If I haven't been running my whole life, if I start now, will, will they not like it or whatever? And it's like, I, I just don't, I, my, my family will tell you, I don't, I don't embarrass easily and that's not because I don't make a lot of mistakes. I do. I just don't, I just don't get embarrassed about it. Cause I'm like, well, of course I failed at this. And of course I was wrong at that. I make mistakes and, and I try to be just as understanding of other people making mistakes and move forward and, and age, you know, I, uh, you know, my brother said to me at one point, I, th I think I mentioned it in the books, the book where he said, uh, where I said, Oh, I don't know if I can do this. And he said, do you think it's going to be easier next year? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Good point. May as well try yeah, now. Sure. You know? I, and I saw somebody uh, just, I want to mention here, somebody said, what was your method to qualify for Boston? Yes. Um, I, I answer that because runners, you know, it really matters to a lot of runners. Um, honestly, and that was Anne, I think, asked that. Anne, I, I. Yes, uh, I, Anne. I educated myself as best I could about what works. And I really did have to embrace things. I, I had to. Did, did you talk to people who had run it? Sure. Oh, sure. I've had friends who've run it for years, and uh, and uh, they had advice. But ultimately, my method was to look at training schedules that looked promising and that were within my grasp, and then through a series of races to do diagnostics on myself to figure out okay what worked and what did not. One thing that I do a lot of, and this is this is runner work. And so, so those of you who aren't runners, you may not like to put hands. <laughs> I almost every race I run, when I get done, I go through and I chart all of my splits and I create a bar graph that shows what I really did mile for mile, not mm -hmm. what I imagine I did. Mm -hmm. It's super easy to imagine. Oh, I was fast here and I was slow here. Go through, look at your splits, figure out if that's true. And if you want to qualify for Boston, I one of my big beliefs, learn how to run negative splits. Learn how to run negative splits. It makes all the difference. Because, not because the negative splits make the difference, but because the discipline of learning to run that way is really powerful. And it, it makes you better. So that's that's part of what I did. And, and you see at a certain point, you're, uh, I'm a little behind here, so this next split has to has to up the game a little. It's more, it's more the first half and the second half of the race. You want to get through the first half of the race feeling comfortable. A, a friend of mine has a great description. He says, the first 10 are easy, the second 10 are hard, the last six are all in your head. And it's kind of right. <laughs> it's kind of right. So you want to get to where you're, uh, you want to get to where you're cruising through 15 to 17 miles, maybe 20 if you can. You know, like that old saying that runners have, you run the first 20 miles to race the last six. <laughs> and that's kind of what you're trying to aim for. But I, but you can do it. There's a lot of information out there. Just just learn from that information. I didn't. I'm, I got my walls are lined here with these great guitars I have. And I love playing guitars. And my wife has said to me, and piano, and my wife has said to me my whole life, you know how much better you would be if you took lessons? And, I'm, <laughs> and I've always been like, well, I can learn myself. Well, running talk. Yeah. It's so much easier to let yeah. the people who already did it teach you. So uh, Regina wants to know uh, about the different vibes of the different uh, marathons. You know, we know that Boston has such a distinct, and you've talked about, you know, the Marine Corps, and you've talked about uh, the one down in Georgia. Um, what makes them so different? Uh, some of it, some of its crowd size. You know, the big, the the big, big marathons like Marine Corps, Chicago, New York, Boston, uh, even like in Atlanta, for example. There's a lot of people at those races, and really big races. 
they become kind of these spectacles, which are great and wonderful. New York is a great race. It's a beautiful race. Um, it's It would not be... Well, Boston's my favorite. I mean, because Boston is holy grail. I mean, that's that's a great race. And, and Boston is a runner's race. You, there's nobody at Boston. I mean, there are people who run for charities. God bless them. They're doing great work. But the vast number of people at Boston are good runners. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great feeling to be in a field of that many good runners. Because you look around and you're like, oh, man, check this out. This is... This is <laughs> There's some stars um, here. <laughs> whereas, whereas any other marathon, you can get lots of people. Marine Corps, you know, Marine Corps is like sort of my hometown marathon. It's a nice race. fun. Race. I've never run Marine Corps well. I've just never, for some reason, been able to put it together well. I think it's a combination of the turns, something like that. Uh, small. I like small marathons. Mm. Or smaller fields, they're a lot of fun. I run Big Sur Marathon virtually every year now. In fact, this year, cheers to him. This year, my daughter Ronnie, who's now done, I think this will be her tenth marathon. Wow! Um, she'll be uh, running it with me again this year. Um, her husband David is going to be out there running as well, and my younger daughter Allie, who's never done a marathon, is training to run Big Sur with us this year. And nice! I'm really excited. Get uh, the family fun. out there. <laughs> no, we have fun. Big Sur is just fun. We don't. We, are we run it. Yeah, but we just. I imagine the scenery yeah. must be fantastic. Oh, highway one, you know, yeah. it's great. You're running on Highway one, and the old guys who were there for the first one, the men and women who ran the first one, they all say, "Hey, we ran the first one because we thought they'll never close Highway one again. We have to." Run <laughs> it. I don't know how many years it's been. I love that race. Great people out there. Uh, one thing before we go, you mentioned how much you love. New Orleans. If you haven't read James Lee Burke. I have. Okay. So you know about how he describes that world yeah. and as horrible as the violence is and the bad things are, but the way he describes it makes you just want to embrace and feel that, what he feels about that that place, that sense you know of that, place. You know that places that are special to you, there is a line from, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, I kept it for years and years. I clipped it out of the newspaper back when we had newspapers. And uh, <laughs> I remember those. I kept it. I kept it for years and years. And then I, I lost it somewhere. But it doesn't matter because I know it by heart. It was the opening of an, an article that said New Orleans is not like it. New Orleans is not so much like another American city as part of a foreign country that washed up on American shores. <laughs> love that. And I, I love New Orleans. I love the history of art and literature and music and beauty down there. And I love, I love, uh, I, I have found things that I love about me. I very much love Boston. I, Boston's a great city, not just for the race. But, uh, you know, my, when Ronnie was up there studying after Georgia Tech, she went and got a double master's at MIT. And she lived on the Boston Marathon course. Mm. So I ran right past her apartment, and my wife. And <laughs> Did you wave? <laughs> it was the greatest thing in the world. So, Tom, thank you so much. I know we could go on for a lot longer, and I didn't even get to all the pre-planned questions because we're having such a good conversation. Uh, if there's any last, absolute, final death questions, please put them in. And otherwise, I'm going to turn you over to Robert. And thank you again. And thank you all for doing this. And also, for any of you out there, I'm on social media, uh, all of them, I, I guess all of them. I don't know what they all are these days. But like uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter, X, whatever that is, and threads. But, uh, you know, if you have questions, and I, I really mean this with people, hit me up, send it to me. If, you, if I don't respond, it's not because I don't want to, it's because I didn't see it. Do you have a website you want to uh, promote? No. I had one for a while. I don't know what to do with it. But, you don't uh, have your book up on your website? No, I did that for a while. It didn't seem to mean anything. But, <laughs> but, I, can be, but I can be reached and 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 put the effort in to reach me because if I see your message, I'll respond to you. And I love readers and I love writers and I love runners and I just love hearing from people. And I really, I like hearing from people. So reach out and if, you know, and, and we'll talk and we'll exchange. I'll tell you about running. I'll tell you about writing. You can tell me about yours. I'm happy to hear it. It's you, almost everything. It's Tom Foreman, Foreman with an E like the boxer uh, at our CNN, Tom Foreman, CNN, something like that. Look for that, find it, and send me messages if you have any other question. I appreciate you listening because honestly, as my wife will tell me, why anybody listens to me, I don't know, but I appreciate it very much. 
Thank you. Thank you again. Robert, take it away. So folks, let's give uh, Dale and Tom a big virtual round of applause for a great conversation. Uh, look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to this recording. Uh, feel free to share it widely. Uh, also in that email will be a link um, uh, to a feedback survey. Please take 30 seconds and fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, and also in that email will be a list of upcoming virtual programs that may be of interest. Uh, Dale will be back with us in four weeks on Tuesday, February 27th at seven o'clock. And he'll be interviewing fellow writer Ian Rogers, who I believe is a novelist. Ian M. Rogers, because there's another Ian Rogers. So <laughs> I did learn that the hard way, yes. Ian M. Yeah. Rogers. Uh, and uh, Ian will be with us uh, in four weeks uh, to give us uh, some uh, writing advice and discuss his uh, writing journey. Uh, in addition, and I didn't plan this, but um, uh, the first Monday in March, we are uh, hosting in person, but we're going to stream it, so it'll be hybrid. We're doing a talk on the history of the Boston Marathon, so I will make there sure you to go. include. Yeah, there we go. Right. So I'll, I'll make sure to in. include information uh, on that one uh, in the email as well. Uh, and the author's name is Paul uh, Clarecki. I might be mispronouncing that, but anyway, that's what's to come. Oh, really? and uh, Tom oh, is showing boy. us his. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom. There I have a, you... a small medallion because I knew the guy that used to paint the uh, starting line. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Tom, Tom has as the close receipts. as I got. <laughs> Tom has the receipts. Tom has his medal. So thanks for showing that, Tom. Uh, and uh, anyway, so without me rambling on, uh, thank you all so, so much for joining us tonight. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Thanks again, Dale. Thanks again, Tom. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye bye. Folks, I'm going to end the session. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.